Welcome. Welcome to the IAA webcast entitled Decarbonization, a Briefing for Actuaries. It is sponsored by the IAA's Resource and Environment Working Group that also sponsored the preparation of a corresponding briefing paper of the same topic uh, by the same name. My name is Sam Gutterman, the Vice Chair of the Working Group, and I'm pleased to moderate this webcast. Uh, this, is a, this is a timely topic. Uh, it was rigorously debated at the COP24 meeting in December in Poland, in which I attended uh, as a representative of the, of the working group. And in a, in a discussion of the, at the United Nations Security Council just last Friday, uh, Rosemary DiCarlo, uh, Under Secretary General for, uh, for uh, Political and Peace Building Affairs, said, the risks associated with climate-related disasters do not represent a, um, a, a scenario uh, from the distant future. They are already uh, a reality uh, in, in millions, affecting millions of people around the globe, and they're not going away. Uh, before I introduce the presenters today, I have to say that the comments made by our presenters represent their personal views and not necessarily the views of the IA or the Resource and Environment Working Group. Uh, we will be fielding questions uh, at the end of the presentations, which will take about 45 minutes. That means we'll have plenty of time in the remaining 25 or 30 minutes uh, for questions. In the meantime, please feel, the free you, feel, please feel free to use the question and answer Q&A feature in the bottom right corner of your screen anytime during the presentation. If your questions, question is directed to a particular presenter, uh, please mention that in your question. Now to provide a very brief introduction to our uh, three presenters who were the principal authors of this briefing paper. The link to the paper will be given at the end of the webcast. We'll be starting with Paul Means, uh, who's an FIA uh, with an MBA and FPMI, who is a consulting actuary from London, England a former member of the Resource and Environment uh, Board of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and a recent trustee of the Institute for European uh, Environment Policy. He now sits on the Institute and Faculty for, of Actuaries Resource and Environment Research and CPD Committee. Paul will be followed by Katerina Lindman, who's an FSA and FCIA, who retired after a 35-year career in the insurance industry in Canada. She's recognized as a leader in the area of climate change and sustainability research, including the Actuaries Climate Index and Actuaries for Sustainable Healthcare. Frank Grossman, our third speaker, is an FSA, an FCIA, and an MAAA, who's an independent consulting actuary and environmentalist based in Toronto, Canada. He has previously delivered a webinar de uh, dealing with climate change impacts for life and health actuaries and has published an article about sustainability reporting. Frank has been a member of the IA's uh, uh, Resource and Environment Working Group since 2012. The first speaker, as I mentioned, is Paul, who will summarize the background to decarbonization, its scope, uh, objectives, and the policies being adopted. Take it away, Paul. Uh, thank you, Sam, and good morning, or good afternoon to those dialing in. And it's really great to have an opportunity to talk to people around the world on this crucial subject for society and for our profession. As Sam said, I'm going to cover why we're decarbonizing, how we're organized globally, and what we need to do. On this next slide, many of you will have seen the, um, these sort of graphs, um, the top one showing the uh, the global average temperature, uh, which is uh, a difficult thing to, to measure, but it's a uh, scientifically uh, sound, rigorous basis. And it shows we've, we've warmed about one degree from the 19th century, um, obviously variations each year. And then the bottom graph is the actual uh, amount of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere, uh, parts, parts per million. And you'll notice that the both, as we know, both these graphs have gone up suspiciously in line with each other. This is the so-called uh, greenhouse effect, 
I think I'm no scientist, but I think the uh, the greenhouse analogy is a, is a pretty good one. Seems to me, you know, the sun. If you've got a greenhouse in your back garden, the, the sun rays they strike the greenhouse. They go through the glass. They heat what's inside the greenhouse. That heats up a bit, and it emits some uh, infrared uh, heat energy. But that energy is basically uh, doesn't go through the glass on the way out. So you get a net increase in uh, heat energy. And um, as we know, greenhouses work. They work very well. You can grow lots of tropical plants even in countries like mine in the, in the, in the United Kingdom. The, and this uh, science has been uh, accepted. You, know, you have the basic the theory, um, which was, I think, um, uh, derived uh, a couple of hundred years ago. And you've got the practice. We can see it's actually happened um, in practice. And this, uh, 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 the science, the, uh, has been accepted by virtually every government around the world. And of course, also by business leaders and by civil society. So that's the point. We need to get uh, greenhouse gas under control. This is the framework. Um, it goes back quite a number of years now. Um, as a body set up by the United Nations. And the first agreement was this Kyoto Protocol uh, signed way back in 1997. It was basically just the European Union, um, Japan, and um, somewhat surprisingly uh, these days, uh, Russia. Um, th they did have um, an agreement. It had very, uh, so n not many people supported it. It had, it had some effects, but uh, uh, that was that. At least it was the first attempt. But the Paris Agreement was a much uh, more comprehensive agreement, and it was actually signed by every, eventually, every country in the world. Um, so it's, it's got uh, a terrific, um, uh, terrific support. And um, the objective, as we all know, is to limit uh, global warming to below two degrees, and hopefully a lot, low, lot lower than two degrees. But as you can see from the graph, we're presently warming by about 0.2 degrees per decade. So I even we as actuaries can work out that we haven't got very far to go. Uh, the IPCC is, is another interesting body, an intergovernmental panel on climate change. It's basically uh, a worldwide organization of scientists who get together and do all the scientific study and analysis and agree the um, conclusions on things like uh, the effect of climate change, what we need to do about it, uh, what's the implications in terms of uh, emissions and things like that. Um, so it's a massive corporate, cooperative exercise, and it does seem to work um, very well. What do we uh, need to achieve? Yeah, um, presently we're emitting something like 42 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent every single year. Um, I had to look it up. Uh, a gigaton is a thousand million tons of uh, carbon dioxide, and we know that uh, carbon dioxide as a gas, it doesn't really weigh very much. So to get a thousand million tons of it into the atmosphere, it's quite a lot of gas. Um, the equivalent means it's not just carbon dioxide, of course. The, the greenhouse gases include things like methane, uh, and nitrous oxide, which are also greenhouse gases. They have a warming um, effect. Uh, and, and those particular ones, uh, they have a much bigger effect uh, than carbon dioxide, although fortunately they don't last quite as long in the atmosphere. Um, the thing about the, um, the, 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 the temperature, because of the, it, it, it's quite logical when you think about it, the, the temperature it, of the planet depends on the total greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So what we've got up there already will lead the, the planet to increase in temperature. Uh, it's just that if we don't put any more up, or we reduce what we, what we do put up, the, um, uh, the temperature won't rise won't be as great. But even if we put no more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the temperature will still carry on rising for a period. And also more, perhaps even more worryingly, the sea level. Ice takes um, uh, the ice on Greenland and on Antarctica will take many, this is what they expected anyway, will take many centuries to actually melt. 
but it will carry on melting again even if there's no more temperature rise than we've got now it'll carry on um, melting um, and eventually if it all melted you could get a sea level rise of over uh, 50 meters so poor old Nelson in Trafalgar Square in London would be um, some way below uh, the surface you could have fish swimming around uh, and that means of course most uh, that would be true of most cities in the world. Most cities in the world are on, are, are very close to the sea, so that will be a problem. But uh, fortunately, I suppose the sea level rise is a longer, seems to be a longer term problem. It's not longer term for some of those island nations in the Pacific, but for many of us, it will be. It, it's it's a, a longer term problem, which hopefully we'll have uh, solutions to. But what is the budget anyway to get to our uh, limits or keep lower limits. There was a very good paper issued by the IPCC last October which addressed these um, issues and one of the things they, um, they concluded was that all the um, problems with temperature rise, the effect on the climate, the effect on mankind, the effect on the ecology are all much greater th at 2 degrees than they are at 1.5. You know we, we don't live in a linear world. A slight increase in temperature has a much greater impact um, on all those other factors on us and every, everything else. And you also got the, that's ignoring really the effect of some of, uh, you've got potential adverse feedback loops, things like um, it, as the ice melts, it exposes land, which absorbs a lot more um, energy from the sun than ice does, which tends to reflect it. So again, that accelerates global warming. And we've all heard about the, um, the possibility that the permafrost in Siberia and uh, uh, northern Canada could um, start to melt, which would lead, um, release methane, which would be which would accelerate global warming as, as well. Yes, the IPCC they, they reckon that um, the carbon budget, in other words, the amount we could put up, the additional amount putting up into the atmosphere, may only be of the order of 500 gigatons. It's about 12 years at the current rate to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. But that figure is it's subject to a huge amount of uncertainty. It, you know, this science, it's highly uh, complex trying to predict um, the influence of all these various factors. So as actuaries, we would certainly um, support anything w which um, uh, looks to b being particularly cautious. And it, it, it's ironic that um, as actuaries, we try and run for example, insurance companies, on the basis that they, they, they're only going to go bust, the chance of them going bust may be only like one in 200, but we're running the whole planet on um, a, a much higher probability of ruin, if you like, in terms of risk of ruin than one in 200. It's, it's that close. Um, uh, but also, it, it's, it's the uncertainty which is the problem. The IPC recommended that, uh, in fact, that we get to zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, uh, let's come on to the next slide, uh, which illustrates some of these points. This is a, a simplified version of what I've just been saying, really. Uh, the black line shows the emissions inexorably going up every year. And what we need to do is start getting them going down uh, drastically in the very near future in order to meet the targets. You know, the 1.5 degrees target. And you'll see from this particular graph that basically to do that, you're going to have to have negative emissions. In other words, we've got to take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, I suppose this is one of those cases where we haven't actually got the technology to do that on a global scale as yet. So we're hoping, the IPCC is hoping that something will turn up so that um, this can be done. In other words, lots of research needs to be done, and I don't think that research is being done at present, certainly not to the same extent. It's not just taking gas out of the atmosphere, it's also perhaps uh, reflecting some of the sun's energy, which again is something which has been mentioned as a possibility, you know, putting things in the upper atmosphere to reflect energy. But again, it's just a, a theoretical thought rather than um, uh, something which you could actually implement, even if you wanted to. On the next um, slide, 
It just shows where the emissions come from um, around the world. It's just by country. And um, the various points on that, I suppose one, th one thing you can see that every country in the world is, uh, they're not all shown on there, but um, every, every, all of us actually contribute to the problem. And we, even if we only contribute a small amount, we're still contributing something. And it's the total which is causing the problem. Uh, China is obviously um, a big emitter because they, uh, apart from anything else, they've got a very big uh, population. You know, about, uh, is it about four times, over four times the United States, for example. But worryingly, if, if you compare China with India, India has only got a slightly smaller population than China, but at presently its emissions are only about a quarter of China's. And obviously, as India um, uh, continues to grow its economy so that all its citizens can enjoy a better life, um, its emissions are inevitably going to be increasing. If we go on to the, the next slide, uh, this is looking at um, another cut at the same uh, issue. By country, it's the top 10 emi emissions by country or, or organization, in the case of the European Union. Um, and again, you can see that India is right on the, um, the bottom right-hand corner. It's, it's one of the top 10 emissions, but only because of its huge population, the emissions per capita are very small, but of course that's only bound to increase, which is um, uh, g going to be a, a huge problem. The, you can have another, I haven't got it here, but you could have another slide which looks not just at the per capita emissions currently. You say, well, that's all very well, but what about all those emissions in the past? And uh, for example, in my country, someone calculated that uh, the United Kingdom in the 19th century, for most of the 19th century, I think, we were responsible for um, uh, mo most of the emissions going up into the atmosphere in the 19th century. I think for mo quite a lot of that time, we were, we were over 80% of the global emissions were coming from just one country, the United Kingdom. So that just emphasizes that, um, well, my country and the developed countries in general have a responsibility in terms of that we've caused most of the problem and it's only right that we should be taking the lead in trying to sort it out. On the next slide, I've uh, had a look at um, how the uh, emissions break down into their source in terms of uh, the activity from which they come, like industry and transport, electricity. I mean, it's fairly, uh, I suppose, it's not surprising that. The only thing I think which is probably is very surprising is the contribution from agriculture. And Katerina is going to be talking a lot more about this in terms of the, 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 the amount coming from uh, meat production. But that also, the sector also includes, under that heading on the, the chart, um, forestry. And um, we all know that the forest has been cut down and uh, burnt. And that, that itself obviously causes greenhouse gas emissions. And also what you're doing in a lot of places, you're replacing um, a carbon dioxide sink. You know, a forest takes in carbon and stores it for something like um, meat production or whatever, where you're, 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 you've basically got an industry which gives out carbon dioxide rather than takes it in. So you're replacing a negative with a positive. So that is the reason why agriculture is amounts to something like 20 25% of the total. Just coming on to the next slide. I, I've got here an example um, commitment. This is from the European Union. Um, the European Union has been developing its policies in there for many years. It's, it has been one of the leading um, uh, organizations uh, to do that. And you see from the chart, it, it's got a fairly um, coherent um, set of uh, targets. I mean, just a couple of points on that. Um, certainly for the later years, these are in the way of targets. We haven't really got the policies um, from the European Union in place which have been uh, accepted by the, the component countries to meet these targets. So it's all very well saying you're going to cut your emissions by these percentages, but you do need the long-term policies to actually make sure that does happen. The other point is the you, you see they're looking to get to 80 and 95 percent by 2050. Now, as, as I was saying earlier, what the IPCC recommend is that you get down to zero. And if you're going to get down to zero, certainly the European Union 
needs to get down, if you like, to below zero. Um, they're the ones with the um, developed ec economies and infrastructure and research and development which should be developing these pro uh, policies. I appreciate the e EU, of course, has expanded uh, rapidly in recent years with the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. So a lot of the countries in Eastern Europe are in a, on a different pathway to uh, some of the other nations. And they are also, if you like, uh, developing countries. So that is a factor which the EU has to um, uh, take account of. On the next slide, uh, China. Yes, China is a developing country, and despite its um, its massive uh, cities and uh, huge achievements over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, its GDP per capita is still only about a quarter of the United States. Obviously, they've got millions and, you know, the population of 1.4 billion, um, a huge proportion of those are still living on a very um, poor um, uh, you know, very poor diet and very very poor standard of living. So the, they are entitled to uh, grow their economy um, to uh, try and rectify that. And that's been recognized in the Paris Agreement by giving them, um, if you like, allowing them more dispensation uh, to do that. And again, it emphasizes the responsibility on the developed world in order that overall that you can achieve some of those objectives. So. On the next slide, um, I'm looking at the global uh, objectives under the various areas. Obviously, coal is, um, uh, if you like, it's an easy, an easy win uh, in a way. And of course, coal, um, apart from being highly undesirable from a climate point of view, it's also become very uneconomic. Um, a lot of uh, coal mining companies in the US, I think, have, have gone bust. And even now, uh, with subsidies, uh, they're just not uh, economic. Um, so that is happening without any uh, particular action by government to replace coal. Um, but of course, replacing coal with gas is just the first step. You've then got to replace, uh, you, you must stop burning gas, or you've got to have a method of um, collecting the carbon which is uh, produced. Uh, renewables have done extremely well in recent years, and, th and the cost of renew uh, renewables, as we all know, has come down a tremendous amount. The uh, um, lifestyle changes, Katarina is going to be talking more about that, and city design. Those things, it, it's a question of designing things in a more sensible way, um, so that you don't need to use so much energy. You, you can work, you go shopping, you can entertain yourself without getting in the car and doing all, all those sort of things. Easier said than done, perhaps easier in, um, in a European context where things tend to be smaller, things tend to be closer. But nevertheless, it's something which um, needs to be taken account of. Yes, yeah, technology, I've mentioned that a few times. That will technology save us? Let's hope so. CCS, that's carbon capture and storage. That's a way of carrying on using fossil fuels, but collecting the carbon uh, produced and storing it underground or something so it doesn't um, cause global warming. It's, it's, I think there are various sort of e embryonic um, plants which um, are using this technology, but uh, I think I'm right in saying there's nothing which is uh, working on a commercial basis. So that's still a uh, work in progress. And sequestration, that's taking carbon out of the atmosphere. That again is something which um, is definitely work in progress. When, when you're talking about um, the 42,000 million tons of carbon dioxide which are going into the atmosphere. What policies do we have? Yeah, carbon taxes. The, to some extent, the, we've had the uh, problem in um, France in, in recent years, where in recent months, where uh, people have been um, uh, protesting about the increase in petrol duty. And of course, it, it, not just in, 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 in that country, it's a very uh, sensitive subject, obviously. Um, and we had it in the United Kingdom a, a few years ago. And I think the politicians need to be a lot more um, creative and uh, more intelligent, I'd say, in, w in what they're doing here. Um, they're not increasing carbon taxes as a way of, um, a new way of getting tax out of your long-suffering population. It's a means of, um, 
avoiding de uh, 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 global warming. So if you are increasing taxes, you should be also reducing taxes in some, some areas. If you're increasing petrol taxes, perhaps you, sh you should be reducing income taxes so the lower paid are not um, unduly um, uh, affected. It's looking at the whole, th the whole thing. Emissions trading schemes, it's not just the EU and China. There's been many other countries that have done that. For example, South Korea, uh, Quebec in Canada, California, New Zealand. And these, are, these do seem to work quite well um, in, in, in making a start on reducing emissions. You have a system whereby you, you license industry to produce emissions and you, you charge them to, to, to take out those licenses. And then you increase the price of them and you reduce the number year by year. So industry has um, an incentive to reduce its emissions. And they have, as I said, worked um, quite well. The, um, as I say, things like um, electric cars. It's amazing, uh, to my mind, how quickly um, the manufacturers of cars have cottoned on to, the, to that. And almost every manufacturer is now um, looking to develop an electric car. Not many seen in driving around, but I'm sure that's going to rapidly change. TCFT, finally, just um, that is the task force for climate-related um, financial disclosure. I think many of you will have come across that. It was the task force set up by the Financial Stability Board of the G8, uh, I think back in 2015. And that's produced uh, in 2017 uh, recommendations for uh, business and for investors to, uh, first of all, work out what their climate strategies are and their decarbonisation strategies and disclose that in their accounts, uh, what their strategies are, their risk management approach, uh, what their emissions are. There's a whole host of uh, different disclosures. And that's been accepted by governments um, around the world and by business, more importantly, and by investors. And I think we as actuaries, um, when we're advising pension funds and insurance companies, have a, a real opportunity there to help um, our clients uh, with those disclosures and um, hopefully also with their strategies for uh, decarbonisation. You're saying climate change is, as, is increasing, we've all seen it. Decarbonisation, we've seen that, we can see it happening, but it seems to me we, we need to see it a lot more if we're going to achieve some of these objectives. Um, well, thank you. I think I'll hand back to Sam now. Uh, second speaker, is, as I mentioned, is, is Katerina Lindman, uh, who will discuss uh, certain uh, sustainability solutions. Katerina. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending this webinar. Sustainability solutions not only represent a great opportunity for avoiding climate breakdown, but they also make the world more secure for everyone. And global security for the masses is a precondition for global sustainability. Sorry, I'm just having trouble advancing the slide. There you go. Conventional economic theory does not take into account ecological limits. Our current economy is about 200 years old, and when we started, the world was quite large compared to human capacity to alter it. But at this point in our history, we have entered the epoch of the Anthropocene where human intervention is affecting the planet more than non-human forces. Our economy now needs to consider the ecological ceiling. Our goal is to stay under that ceiling so we are in a safe operating space. That ceiling represents the outer ring of the donut. We have exceeded the ceiling in terms of climate change, loss of biodiversity, land use, and nitrogen and phosphorus loads. The 10% of the wealthiest people on this planet are largely responsible for exceeding the ecological ceiling, as we will demonstrate in the next slide. Conversely, we have many people on our planet that are consuming too few resources to access life's necessities. For true sustainability, people would have access to what they need in terms of food, water, shelter, sanitation, peace, and human rights, which represents the social foundation or inner ring of the donut. Likely, most of the people listening to this webinar belong to the richest 10% of people on this planet. This group is responsible for 49% of greenhouse gas emissions. To quote Pogo, 
we've met the enemy, and the enemy is us. The poorest 50% of people on this planet are responsible for only around 10% of lifestyle emissions. They are the most vulnerable to climate change and also the least responsible. This makes it a moral imperative for the top 10% to act decisively to lower the risk for all, and in particular, to the most vulnerable. This slide shows some interesting perspectives on how much it would cost to move towards a social foundation. The cost of ending hunger for all um, would mean uh, is only 3% of our global food supply. Since we waste about one third of our food, saving 3% of it only means that we need to reduce one eleventh of our food waste and divert that to the people who suffer from chronic hunger. Ending income poverty for all will only mean redirecting 0.2% of global income. And ensuring electricity for all would only mean redirecting 1% of global carbon dioxide emissions. So these solutions are within reach provided that we have enough political will to fully support the sustainable development goal of the United Nations. I'm now gonna speak about drawdown. What is drawdown? It's the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. The concept of drawdown means that the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere starts to draw down rather than increase and it has been since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. How can we draw down the amount of greenhouse gas pollution? Well, a team of scholars, scientists, entrepreneurs, and activists studied the most promising 100 solutions and decided that if we pursued 80 of them, that we could begin to reverse global warming. This slide shows the top 10 solutions. These solutions all exist today, and they are ranked in order of how much carbon dioxide equivalent they can reduce or sequester. The number one solution is refrigerant management. This is being worked on through the United Nations via an amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which successfully tackled the hole in the ozone layer. The second solution is constructing more onshore wind turbines for creating electricity. Solutions three, four, and five are all related. They have to do with food, reducing food waste, adopting plant-rich diets, i.e. reducing the consumption of animal products, and thirdly, preventing the destruction of tropical forests. They are all powerful ways to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll have more details about the adoption of plant-rich diets later in the presentation. I'm now gonna give you an overview of the Oxford Food Study. It's a five-year study and it uses life cycle analysis and it covers 90% of the world's food production. The study measures five indicators uh, about environmental degradation. The indicators are greenhouse gas emissions, which are so important for uh, global warming, land use, which is also important because if, um, if, the, if the forests are uh, destroyed, then that, uh, Um, emits carbon, but if they're reforested, that is a way of um, sequestering emissions. So that is sort of a non-technical way to to um, sequester greenhouse gases. Terrestrial acidification is also referred to as acid rain, uh, which hurts um, biodiversity. And then eutrophication is a measure of sulfur dioxide or um, which is water pollution and, uh, sorry, that's phosphates and nitrates, which can then lead to a lack of oxygen and, and dead zones. Lastly, water use is measured, weighted by local water scarcity. Two thirds of freshwater withdrawals are for irrigation. So again, there's that uh, connection to how we grow our food and water scarcity is certainly becoming a concern. This slide shows the greenhouse gas emission per 100 grams of protein. Now, each of these bars represent uh, the middle 80% of producers. So we're going from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile, with the average shown where the color changes from light to dark. So you'll notice that there's a lot of variation 
um, particularly with uh, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, for cattle. Um, and you'll notice that plant-based foods are much more efficient than animal products. Joseph Poor, the lead author of the study, decided to go vegan after working on the study for one year. And to quote him, he said, a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth, not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use, and water use. It is far bigger than cutting down in your flights or buying an electric car, he said, as these only cut greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this sh slide shows what the impacts are on land use. And the low impact items in terms of land use are the vegan items, namely nuts, peas, and other pulses, i.e. beans and legumes, ground nuts, and tofu. The rest of the items are animal products. And you can see from this chart that the big land users are beef herds, lamb, and cheese. And again, land is significant because it's been deforested to allow animals to graze or grow feed for animals and letting this land revert back to nature would preserve biodiversity and also store carbon. Um, again, you see that there's a lot, lots of variation. So uh, one idea would be that there would be labeling of food products to tell you your, the ecological impact, which would also um, help uh, tilt producers and consumers to go towards things that have lower environmental impact, even within a food category. For acidifying emissions, note that pork, dairy, and beef and farms shellfish are the big contributors to acid rain. Uh, with respect to creating ocean and river dead zones, uh, the big contributors are dairy herds and farm shellfish. And the big uses of water weighted by water scarcity is cheese, nuts, and farmed fish. Just a word from the nutritional uh, professionals. This is the largest organization, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, that says vegetarian vegan diets are healthful, may prevent and treat chronic diseases, and are better for the environment. In conclusion, uh, one of the main findings of the Oxford Food Study uh, is that meat, eggs, dairy, and aquaculture uses 83% of the farmland, but produces only 18% of the calories. This implies that uh, if we replace those 18% of calories with vegan, with plant-based alternatives, we could free up about 80% of the land, which would enable that to return to the wild, which would store more carbon and provide more habitat for wildlife. And it would also reduce agriculture freshwater use by about 20%. And uh, it would reduce those greenhouse gases, water pollution, and air pollution by about half. The number one reason uh, people die in Canada and the United States is because of heart disease, or more precisely, atherosclerosis. Uh, here we have a picture of a normal artery, artery and one that has atherosclerosis. The diseased artery has cholesterol lining the artery, which builds up on the interior of the artery wall, which can lead to blockage of the artery, as well as having the, the piece of cholesterol break off and damage the heart. This chart shows the risk factors for atherosclerosis. As you can see, of the 10 main risk factors, The buildup of cholesterol is the only one that's necessary for the buildup of plaque and therefore the disease itself. Too much cholesterol in the blood is due to too much cholesterol in the diet, and cholesterol is found solely in animal products. Although humans respond to dietary cholesterol at different rates, everyone can lower their cholesterol levels by decreasing the amount of cholesterol that they ingest. Foods high in fiber, and fiber is only found in plants that has not gone through a process to remove it help the body to get rid of excess cholesterol. In conclusion, we have a chance to avoid climate breakdown and provide the necessities of life to all by adopting the goal of donut economics, uh, wasting less food, eating much less beef as it's particularly inefficient in its use of the planet's resources, eating much less animal products, it's a good way to improve overall health, and also 
uh, animal products can contain cholesterol, saturated fat, and can accumulate toxins in greater quantities than if a person ate uh, the plants directly. And eating fewer processed foods also improves overall health by reducing our exposure to hydrogenated vegetable oils, high fructose corn syrup, and chemicals that we would not add to foods if we were cooking them ourselves. Here's some resources for more information. Uh, so Donut Economics and Drawdown were covered in the presentation and are, are worth your time to go into more detail. Uh, Actuaries for Sustainable Healthcare is a new group with a mission to achieve the financial stability of healthcare systems through the use of whole food plant-based nutrition. Uh, Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen, can, uh, it's a free app and you can learn about the dozen most powerful foods to help you get and stay healthy. And if you eat those foods, it'll be much easier to avoid eating those unhealthy and resource intensive foods. And lastly, Forks Over Knives is a documentary about chronic diseases caused by the standard American diet and the benefits of whole food plant-based nutrition. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, before uh, I uh, move the mic to uh, Frank, um, one question that was raised uh, is, will the slides be available and can they be shared? The answer to both of those questions are yes. Uh, they will be available on the IA website uh, and they can be shared uh, to uh, as many people as you'd like. Now, now the third speaker is Frank Grossman who will discuss the actual implications of what we've been talking about uh, uh, in this presentation. Frank. Thanks, Sam and Katerina and Paul. Hello to everyone on the line with us today. The third segment will of our presentation will tackle actual implications of decarbonization. Moving along to the next slide, please. Asking what will be the actual implications of decarbonization is an open-ended question that leads to a futurism exercise. This is because actual implications depend on how well we're able to manage greenhouse gas emissions and avert catastrophic climate change. So what follows are potential implications for actuaries. It's pretty clear that the wide-ranging consequences of decarbonization will make the work of investment actuaries more challenging. Uncertainty about energy prices, both for conventional and unconventional fossil fuels, as well as renewables, will invariably translate into market volatility, which is not a bad thing if you view market volatility as an asset class. What's clear is that uncertainty about energy makes decisions about which investments to buy, hold, and sell fundamentally more complicated not only in the energy sector, but for all businesses that have a significant carbon footprint. One of the problems with growth, defined as the annual change in gross domestic product, is that GDP treats economic goods and bads equally. For example, if a coastal community suffers storm damage, then the cost of recovery from the devastation, both for firms and households alike, and possibly for governments too, increases GDP and results in higher economic growth. According to Herman Daly, situations in which the costs of economic activity begin to outstrip its benefits can be viewed as uneconomic growth. This means that the level of sustainability adjusted growth in the face of climate change is generally lower than otherwise reported. The transition to a low carbon economy often follows a predictable pattern, beginning with conservation efforts, proceeding to the implementation of more efficient energy solutions, followed by the substitution of renewables for fossil fuels, but then runs out of steam as an old business model struggles to adapt. Yet there will be opportunities for investment actuaries to back firms that develop more effective decarbonization strategies. For example, sourcing inputs closer to home may make good business sense in a low carbon future. Another example is recognizing that both steel and cement are significant sources of greenhouse gas emissions, and that opting for innovative wood construction could be a smarter choice for a new high-rise building, with the added benefit that wood is a carbon sink, as Paul mentioned, in as much as it absorbs and retains atmospheric carbon dioxide. 
Recall the distinction between efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency is doing things right, while effectiveness is doing the right things. Moving on to the next slide. Actuarial modelers may anticipate nonlinearities. Sea level rise may not be gradual, and the continued ability of our oceans to absorb both heat and carbon dioxide is open to question. Both are familiar examples of tipping points. And while we may look forward to natural gas producers eliminating so-called fugitive methane emissions, it's the methane from biological sources that poses an unquantifiable risk at this point, not just due to melting permafrost, but from tropical regions too, as the hydrological system that drives our climate transforms our world into one that's both warmer and wetter. It's possible that the historical improvement in mortality and morbidity rates may not continue into the future due to more infectious and chronic illnesses. Potential contamination of our food chain is also a possibility, and I mentioned plastic in my slide referring to the breakdown of plastic waste in our oceans due to sunlight and wave action and the resulting consumption of microparticles by sea life. Traditionally, GDP growth has been correlated with significant improvement in life expectancy in developing countries, a good news story. But uneconomic growth may mean more expensive food in the future, as well as less public funding for health care and sanitation. And the last point on slide 38 refers to the looming prospect of an intractable intergenerational dilemma. If the costs of decarbonization are kicked down the road for future generations, including actuaries to deal with, Moving on to the next slide. Programs of insurance rely on the pooling of risks to manage uncertain outcomes, and it's the variation in outcomes that I'd like to touch on. We might anticipate that historical data, though credible, may become less relevant going forward as claim frequencies and severities change. And please note that, as a matter of convenience, I'm not drawing a distinction between risk and uncertainty here while accepting that they're not exactly the same thing. If decarbonization does not happen quickly enough, one could envision a community located in a 100-year floodplain suffering flood damage more frequently than once every 100 years. The point being that the design of economically viable insurance coverages becomes more difficult when a claim payment looks increasingly like a sure thing. Doubtless new opportunities for innovative types of insurance coverage will present themselves, yet existing types of insurance may have to evolve in response to a changing physical environment. Actuaries will have to cultivate greater understanding of risk factors and their interactions. For example, the lack of air conditioning during an urban heat wave or an electricity outage with a similar result in contrast to the combined effect of heat and high humidity during a heat wave. Ultimately, economic scenario generators may have to share actuarial shelf space with integrated scenario sets, ones that reflect environmental, political, and social factors in combination with economic factors, if only because our future no, long, no longer looks that similar to our past. Moving on to my last slide. Given all that Katerina, Paul, and I have said about decarbonization during the last few minutes, it's quite likely that the future will outwit our certainties. Yet that's where our time-tested actuarial methodologies come in, analyzing data, building useful models, testing results, communicating findings. Actuaries will have to collaborate with experts in other fields regarding decarbonization. But that too is an opportunity for our profession and not so much a potential implication as a sure thing. We're entering a terra incognita or unknown land as the post-carbon world unfolds before us. And our actual focus as ever is not so much on future decisions to come. Our focus is on the futurity of decisions being made today. And so that concludes our prepared presentations. Back to you, Sam. Thanks, Frank. I uh, hope this has given a, a good uh, background uh, for the questions, uh, questioning period we have. Um, I'll start off the, some of the questions, and we have about 20, 25 minutes to go with, in, uh, with questions and answers, so hopefully we can get some dialogue 
uh, and some responses to the questions that are asked. Uh, but the first question that was asked that we received was the role of nuclear um, that was listed in some cases it's been listed under renewables, uh, which um, it may or may not be. Uh, uh, would, would any of the presenters like to, to address whether uh, nuclear energy uh, is a potential um, answer or a partial answer to this question? Uh, is Paul here? Shall I, shall I come in first of all? It's, it's something we touched on um, in, our, in our paper. Um, the problem uh, on nuclear um, seems to be that the, in terms of building new nuclear uh, power stations, the, the, the ones, uh, a lot of them seem to be set by high, uh, huge uh, cost overruns and also uh, delays and technological problems. Um, so you know, looking at from perhaps from the United Kingdom, it, it doesn't seem a very, and of course in, our own, in my own country, United Kingdom, I think we had plans to build a number, and I think we're now down to one. Most of our foreign partners have pulled out for various reasons, um, perhaps because of the cost and, and issues um, uh, like that. So those are commercial, if you like, they're commercial problems. Uh, we had the problem in, in Japan where the, they had a nuclear power station which was quite close on the coast and it was hit by a tidal wave. Um, so the, those, and, and that's been an absolute nightmare obviously, uh, and also in terms of trying to sort it out. So the, there are a number, of, and then you've got the problems, if, even if you have something which is working, uh, you've got the problem of decommissioning in 50, 80 years time and uh, storing the waste in the meantime. People you know, don't mind nuclear power stations perhaps as long as nobody's storing the waste uh, near them. And then on top of that, you've got the fact that uh, there are already many nuclear power stations in existence. France, for example, um, almost relied entirely on nuclear power um, at one time, I think that that may be changing there, uh, and, uh, and obviously America's got a lot. But the stations which were built originally are now having to be to be rebuilt, or sorry, to to be uh, replaced. And you have the problems which um, I've already mentioned. So, whatever your views on nuclear power, it's you could say the practical problems and the commercial problems are proving quite difficult. Thanks, Frank. Um, one thing that was mentioned uh, was the economic growth, the uh, GDP. Uh, what effect do you think that the decarbonization, or the, if you if you would like to express it as transition, have on economic growth? This is Katerina. Um, I don't know if that's the right question, right? Like I, in um, according to Donut Economics, it's uh, one of the things is that it's really agnostic about growth. So they're saying as long as we get to the point where people, everyone's living within the ecological uh, ceiling, but everyone also has a social foundation, um, it really doesn't matter about economic growth as such. And part of that is because, uh, you know, it's self-evident we do want for sustainability people to have access to everything they need for security. And we also need to live within our ecological limits. Uh, otherwise, we don't have a future on the planet. And then also bringing into account uh, the things that Herman Daly uh, pointed out about not all economic growth is good, uh, because goods and bads are put in the same bucket. But it, OK. Um, just, just to come in on that, uh, again on that, it's an important point, Sam, so if I may just come on that. I mean, it, it's, uh, if you like, it's a, a crucial point for us, isn't it, as, as actuaries. Obviously, you can see particular industries, it's going to have a massive effect on some industries. Some will be very positive, you know, like obviously the, the renewable industry or if you're electric cars and you're, you're, you're into that uh, side of things. Whereas if you're into something which is adversely affected, um, it's not so good. But the, so you can look at things in terms of, uh, it's, it's certainly, a, there's a great opportunities there. 
and that will be a great growth for those for those people who are on the right side of uh, history on that, and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's probably, as Katarina said, and I think Frank, Frank um, mentioned as well, it's a question of, if you look at the overall picture, I, s I suppose that more will have to be spent on things which don't increase people's standard of living. It just enables them to have a reasonable a life, doesn't it? It protects their, their life, but it, if it means more on various bits of infrastructure. And of course, we've been talking about decarbonisation. We're not talking about um, adaption to climate change, which is a whole other subject, which also will require a huge investment. So I think it, I suppose I'm saying it, it, economic growth, what, what do we mean by that? But it, it means more uh, growth. It means more growth in the air, in some areas, more growth also in terms of things to protect us, but less growth in terms of personal consumption. Related to uh, the economy and, and finances, uh, one question that was raised is the effect of of climate change and the transition decarbonization on investment returns. Clearly, this is a, a can be a significant assumptions for for almost all actuaries uh, in, in their work. Um, any thoughts about the effects of, of this whole process or processes on asset returns or on assets, investments? Okay, this is Katerina. Uh, well, first of all, if we, uh, if we don't decarbonize, then uh, a lot of the assets will actually be in trouble, like physical asset risk, uh, litigation risk, uh, and so on. But if the uh, looking at kind of asset returns, I think it does depend on the extent that uh, the corporation, if that's the asset, like the shares in that corporation, uh, can be part of the decarbonization and clean tech economy, because that's going to be where the, the profits and the opportunities are. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to say uh, something like a coal power plant uh, getting good investment returns in the long run when we're phasing out uh, things like dirty uh, coal energy. Yes, Sam, it's Frank here. So um, the impact of decarbonization on investment returns is, uh, is a wide open question. And it's not only returns, it's risks, obviously. Katarina's just touched on this. Um, I think that as actuaries, we're pretty good taking the long view and that's important so we're we need again to get definitions in place we're talking returns over the near term the medium term the long term all in costs for example on nuclear something paul mentioned i think very well a few minutes ago i mean some will say roi on nuclear is pretty good if you ignore decommissioning and storage of waste oops is that part of the deal i don't know more practically, there are issues around carbon, um, things that the carbon tractor, tracker group have looked at, which about stranded assets. This, for example, might be private stranded assets, fossil fuels that really cannot be extracted and burned if we're going to stay under a carbon budget that will avoid, again, catastrophic climate change. But there's also concerns around stranded public assets. If a government builds a pipeline, the way things are, there's a lot of pressure to use the pipeline to move, to move oil or natural gas from one end of the country to another. And there's the whole issue of sunk costs. How easily would someone walk away from an investment if the continued use of that investment actually could have a negative effect for all? So the concerns about returns are well-founded. But again, there's a need to get some rigor into the analysis, returns over what time horizon and what type of risks are we willing to undertake when we talk about return? Certainly there's, there's every opportunity for gaming of international protocols and a massive <laughs> failure of the commons. Thanks everybody. Um, turning to to um, continuing on, on the track of, of impacts on extra work, um, whether or not you're in a, a pension, life insurance, property casualty insurance, uh, how do, how do you, any, any thoughts about how decarbonization 
and that process can affect uh, our clients. Uh, and any any thoughts about um, that aspect? Well, just uh, come in uh, first, Sam. Hey, uh, in terms of uh, pension fund veterans, uh, obviously one of the the issues for them is to make sure they understand how decarbonisation is going to affect their clients. And obviously, if, if your if your client is an oil company, you need to, and, and they're funding a deficit in the pension scheme, you need to understand uh, how long have they got. I mean, uh, uh, how long are you relying on them um, having reasonable profits in order to um, to to fund uh, that deficit? So that's very obviously important. And then from the point of view of the pension fund itself, um, you're looking at things. Uh, what what is it invested in? Can it uh, should it be investing in things? Particularly, obviously, if it's in if if the sponsor is a, an oil company, maybe you don't want to have quite so much. Um, you don't want to have too many eggs in one basket, as it were. So, that, uh, but also in terms of the longer term issues regarding uh, decarbonisation, you, you you want to try and, and ensure, as far as you can, that your portfolio is insulated against some of the uh, the risks. Um, and also, obviously, as regards climate change itself, that will affect, um, you know, as Katarina was saying, um, uh, things like the uh, your demographic, your mortality assumptions, or your your morbidity uh, assumptions. And insurance companies, uh, the uh, I, I think somebody also asked a question about um, scenarios for uh, insurance companies. Um, if, if they haven't done so already, I, I'd certainly urge people uh, to look at the, as a website which the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure have set up, which is like um, a, uh, uh, a place where people can put their, uh, uh, how they're dealing with um, the, the, the requirements of that uh, the task force and, and what techniques they're using uh, uh, to provide scenarios, what some scenarios they're using, and how they're using it, and there is a, a mass of information um, on that website. So if you, if you Google TCFD, and then you, that will lead you onto this. Um, it's like a working um, place where you can just um, drop uh, a lot of stuff, and you, you can find a lot of information there. Uh, also, there's a lot of the regulators around the world. I think. Um, uh, for example, the you know, the Bank of England in, in the United Kingdom and uh, the Californian state um, insurance regulator, they've formed a, a global um, uh, association which develops um, approaches towards uh, climate change, including uh, decarbonisation. And th there's information on, on that particular website as well. One, one question that was raised is the question of job opportunities for actuaries in this in this field um, uh, clearly there's there's been a number of let's say casually actuaries who have been involved in environmental environmental liabilities uh, but so far we as a profession haven't um, been totally focused in on the environment and the environmental effects any any thoughts uh, from any of the panelists about uh, potential job opportunities. Where, 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 where can actuaries either play a role or develop business or provide service to their customers or the public? This is Katarina. Uh, certainly the uh, task force on climate-related financial disclosures is a way for actuaries uh, working in institutions to get involved. Another question was with relationship and following up on what Katarina just said was the ESG factors, um, uh, the environmental, social, and governance factors. Most most focus has been on on the environmental area. Uh, I, I personally think that that actuaries uh, with uh, with uh, our long term viewpoints, uh, assessments, uh, and limitations of of actual modeling uh, can can potentially play a role. Uh, obviously, you need, need a, a more information than just what's provided in this, in this website, but there's a rich opportunity out there to look at the environment as a contingency uh, 
in terms of uh, probability distributions, in terms of looking at investigating detail. So I think that that's a source. Uh, other comments about um, uh, what actuaries can contribute uh, and what potential jobs are there that actuaries uh, might pr pursue or services that actuaries can, uh, might pursue. Yeah, I think um, on, on the, the invest investment side, as, as, as Frank um, was, was mentioning, the, there, are, there are definitely opportunities, I would say, on the investment side for actuaries. Um, obviously, many actuaries are already working in that area, but with actuaries, a lot of, uh, you know, to be a slightly denigrate uh, investment analysis, they're very good at looking backwards and explaining exactly why the stock market went down last year or whatever the thing is. Uh, but actuaries, uh, their, their whole business is looking forward. And I think in a, in, a, in a situation where you're in uncharted territory, it is an opportunity for us to, to work in investment houses and um, analyze and look at scenarios and, and things like that. So I think that's an opportunity. Also, I, I have come across actuaries who work uh, in a very different area uh, on the electricity supply, um, looking at um, how that could uh, develop uh, model um, the requirements of uh, electricity in, in future years. It's, 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 very, it's very susceptible to uh, modeling. And uh, I've seen one where they were looking at, um, they had a model of how, how, how much the wind was, where the wind was blowing, how hard it was blowing, where it was blowing to, and from that you could work out how much electricity uh, would be available to uh, to keep the lights on. So that sort of uh, stuff. But obviously you can't just go into that. You need to have an entree. You need to work in a, a consulting business of some sort who are already uh, are doing that. And so you can learn, as it were, um, the, the techniques involved. It, it, it is quite specialist. And there are lots of non-actuaries who are, who are also highly skilled in that area. Mm -hmm. And this is Katarita. Another area uh, would be for health actuaries to get involved with uh, making our healthcare system sustainable. So figuring out uh, ways to compensate perhaps doctors and employers uh, for uh, ways to encourage the uh, whole food plant-based diet, which you know has a sustainability factor in there both in terms of climate change and in reducing costs uh, for the healthcare system. Katerina, following up on that, um, one question about meat consumption. Uh, with the developing world increasingly moving toward, to, toward eating more meat, um, is, it unrealistic, is, is it unrealistic to expect an overall reduction of greenhouse gases from agriculture? Uh, well, I think the future there is in our hands of uh, the people in the developed world because uh, they're the really large meat eaters and whether there can be a shift. Like it's, it depends how seriously we take our uh, obligation uh, for, you know, the collective responsibility for the sustainability of the planet. I think... Um, oh. One what question are your is, thoughts on um, that, Sam? Like, do you want to? <laughs> well, I th I think that uh, there's a, a agriculture obviously a, 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 that produces a quarter of uh, greenhouse gases is a is a ripe area for um, for future uh, uh, decarbonization. Uh, there's been um, better land use, uh, um, smart agriculture has a number of smarter uh, deforestation plan, uh, programs. There's a lot of opportunities out there, but yet uh, the question is in some areas whether the political will and the finan financial will uh, will be able to, to uh, overcome this. Uh, I, in some respects, um, because of the, the huge developments that are going around in different parts of the, uh, different continents, I, I think this is going to be a real challenge. Um, but I think the whole issue of decarbonization is is a represents a huge challenge, and it's so, so huge that that I think that actuaries can have a, a play a role, uh, that they um, maybe think a little bit broader uh, and try to understand the underlying issues. Uh, and and this is an area that is going to actuaries have to seek out uh, services to provide 
uh, rather than just uh, waiting for the clients to come in uh, based on uh, regulation. Sam, it's Frank. And so Katerina has mentioned political will and of course regarding agricultural use, you've had comments as well. But Mother Nature has the last word in this realm. Um, as climate has changed, for example, in the uh, U.S. Midwest, um, farmers are finding that they really can't grow the same type of corn that they traditionally did. Its requirements aren't fitting very well with the evolving environment. So, for example, farmers in Iowa end up growing corn today that used to be grown in Missouri, further south. And the varieties that Iowa farmers used to grow are now being grown further north in Minnesota. And if you go southwest from Iowa into Kansas, some farmers aren't able to grow corn anymore at all. They're growing things like soybeans that have less water requirements. So there is a intractability here. We can talk about political will and designs, but Mother Nature has a say in what we're able to do as well. Spe speaking per personally, I, I think that there's there's been nothing like a whole lot of uh, storms and cyclones and, and uh, floods uh, to peak uh, the interests of, of uh, the general population. And you've seen an, a significant increase in concern in the last two years, just as a result of warmer temperatures uh, and natural disasters. And, 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 I, and I think you're right, Frank. I think uh, political, political will follows uh, consumer sentiment. And when there's something that's driving like uh, natural disasters, um, there is nothing more like that to, than to push uh, on the climate change issue. Uh, I hate to say that, but that's probably true. We've got uh, just a couple of minutes uh, left in this uh, in, in the schedule. I'd like to uh, give all the three panelists just a, uh, a, a short chance or a chance for some short comments uh, to sum up what they think is the the significant issues that actuaries uh, and uh, uh, those people uh, listening in on this webcast and, and those who uh, unfortunately are not, what type of the messages, uh, or what are the key drivers uh, that you that should should uh, participants have a takeaway on, on this issue? I'll start with uh, uh, with Frank. Thanks, Sam. Uh, for the actuaries on the line, the future may look very different than the past. And there's a need for actuaries to kind of up their game and get ready for, um, for an evolving post-carbon future. Katerina? Uh, I agree with Frank. There's going to be lots of changes uh, in the next 12 years if we're going to actually decarbonize our economy, which I, I really hope we do for the sustainability of our, our, of our future. Um, I would encourage actuaries to, to get involved and uh, we need more people to raise their voices. So if, if you can influence uh, your company or your own um, place of employment to speak out and uh, help build that political will for the conservative action that we need, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with um, uh, what Frank and Katarina have uh, said. I, I, I suppose that you will say, you know, this is the critical time. But um, I think it is, uh, you know, this five or ten years is a critical time. I mean, I think the, um, I think uh, business and and the, and, the, and the general public are ahead of politicians in, in most most countries. I mean, my impression from this side of the Atlantic is is you know climate change is, is is just generally accepted now we move on I mean every single business leader has it on uh, their agenda um, and of course that as actuaries these people are, are our clients you know we need to be ahead of them we need to know um, you know we need to thought about the issue and um, thought about the implications for them and for ourselves and for our advice it is difficult you know we've got we've demonstrated that there's no easy answers on this. Um, and I, 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 you know, we, we haven't given any easy answers in this uh, presentation, but I, ho I hope we've given um, some thoughts, uh, perhaps um, uh, some pointers to what people to, to, to go forward. So I, th I think we as actors uh, should be in a position where we can talk sensibly to our clients about these issues, what may be involved. 
And I, t I certainly urge people to, to, to you know, if you haven't already, to learn as much as you can about the subject and think about the issues. That's a good summary. We we didn't get to all the questions raised, but I, hopefully we covered uh, um, many of them. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, please uh, send an email to uh, uh, the next slide. Hopefully we can get the next slide. It doesn't seem to want to advance sometimes. I don't know why. Okay. Well, the, there is there is a, uh, a link to the briefing paper. You can also see this on the IAA website. Um, if these presentations have whetted your appetite for more information, uh, please read through the entire briefing paper. Uh, and other, uh, here, here it is. Uh, the, uh, this is where you can go for the briefing paper. Uh, with the URL link given. Um, this uh, presentation uh, will be available on the IA website. Uh, it, uh, your feedback on this and whether or not we need similar or related uh, pres uh, webcasts, uh, that would also be appreciated. And send us your comments uh, to the technical.activities at actuaries.org. Thanks. Thanks for the, the three presenters, uh, uh, Paul, Katarina, and, and Frank, uh, for their time and efforts in preparing these remarks uh, and, and also the, to the briefing paper itself. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you.